Now we're going to have a look at the floor of the oral cavity. And first off, we can say that included among the tissues that form the floor of the oral cavity are going to be the geniohyoid muscles, the mylohyoid, and the anterior digastrics. See, the geniohyoid, and remember I've taken the right side of the face and everything away here, uh, the geniohyoid actually will originate at the inferior mental spine of the mandible, which would be anteriorly here, and ins inserts on the body of the hyoid bone here. When this muscle contracts, what it's going to do is going to be depress the mandible and elevate the hyoid bone a little, a little bit. The nerve supply is going to be via the C1 spinal nerve, which travels along with the hypoglossal nerve. Here's your mylohyoid. And the mylohyoid is very important, kind of like it's easy to recognize because its fibers run perpendicular to those of the geniohyoid and mylohyoid. Okay, it'll originate on its own special little line called the myohyoid line of the mandible, and it'll insert into the body of the hyoid bone as well. When this muscle contracts, you see the fibers running basically, well, perpendicular, as I said, to the or, uh, direction of the geniohyoid fibers. When this contract it'll help pull up or elevate and draw the hyoid bone forward which leads to elevation of the tongue and depression of the mandible oh by the way it's innervated by the nerve to the monohyoid duh and uh, we have here the anterior digastric remember if there's an anterior something there's going to be a posterior well the posterior digastric we have hidden now but the anterior digastric a it's also innervated by the nerve to the monohyoid B, it originates on the digastric fossa of the mandible, which would be anteriorly here. Yes, the mandible is hidden, that's why you don't see it. And it'll insert on the intermediate tendon, which is going to be this part of it here, where it connects to the posterior digastric. When the anterior, anterior digastric contracts, what it'll do is it's going to help elevate the hyoid bone and pull the mandible down or depress the mandible. So now let's have a quick little review of some of the muscles that we've already dealt with and some of the nerves that are important for us. So we have here the tongue. We know that the tongue has both intrinsic and extrinsic muscles. Um, we'll deal with the more detailed functions of these in a little bit. You can see also coming up from up here where number two is, Number two is actually the lingual nerve. Remember, the lingual nerve is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. So it's from V3. The lingual nerve, very, very importantly, is joined by the chorda tympani, which actually comes from cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve. And the chorda tympani will bring both special sensory taste fibers to the anterior two thirds of the tongue and parasympathetics that will synapse in the submandibular ganglion. Okay, so the lingual nerve contains general sensory afferents, just general sensation, that is like if you bite the tip of your tongue or something, for the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. However, as it is joined by the chorda tympani, it also has taste fibers to the anterior two-thirds and parasympathetics to the submandibular ganglion. The parasympathetics from the submandibular ganglion will then be distributed to the submandibular gland and the sublingual glands. Back here, we have labeled number four. That is the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve number nine. Cranial nerve number nine is one of those four cranial nerves, three, seven, nine, and ten, that also has parasympathetics. Well, the glossopharyngeal nerve will innervate the stylopharyngeus, for instance, but also the posterior one-third of the tongue. And the glossopharyngeal nerve will convey taste fibers, so special sensory afferents from the posterior one-third of the tongue. So if you are asked what provides taste fibers to the tongue, you would reply correctly. The anterior two-thirds are supplied via the chorda tympani that comes from the facial nerve, the posterior one-third comes from the glossopharyngeal nerve. Down here, moving further down, number five is the hypoglossal nerve. 
The name implies that it goes deep to the tongue, and that is true. The hypoglossal nerve will enter deep to the tongue. It kind of loops around behind the posterior digastric and then goes underneath the tongue, and it innervates all of the intrinsic tongue muscles. It also innervates the styloglossus. Actually, speaking of which, anything with the term stylo in its name implicates it comes from the styloid process. So there are three muscles that attach to the styloid process. It would be the styloglossus, the stylohyoid, and the stylopharyngeus. And these three muscles have three different innervations. Styloglossus by the hypoglossal, stylohyoid by the facial nerve, and the stylopharyngeus by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Please do note, however, that the pharyngeal constrictors are innervated by the pharyngeal branch of the vagus nerve, so cranial nerve number 10, with the exception of the stylopharyngeus, which is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve number 9. Down here is the thyrohyoid muscle, and this is innervated by a little branch that has hitched a ride on the hypoglossal nerve. It's a nerve to the thyrohyoid, which is basically a branch of the C1 spinal nerve that just hitches a ride on the hypoglossal nerve. Here's the hyoglossus muscle, here's the geniohyoid, the genioglossus, submandibular duct, submandibular gland. So let's see if we can summarize some of what we've learned about the tongue so far. So all of the muscles of the tongue are going to be supplied by the hypoglossal nerve, except for one muscle, which would be the palatoglossus. Okay, and the hypoglossal nerve, we can see as it kind of loops around and then dives deep to the tongue. Here highlighted is your hypoglossal nerve. For general sensation, touch, temperature, we have your lingual nerve that supplies it to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The posterior one-third of the tongue is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Remember that the special sensory fibers that are reaching the tongue that are important for taste, they actually come from the lingual nerve via the corda tympani, which is a little bit higher up here, right up there, as it joins the lingual nerve. And the corda tympani comes from cranial, cranial nerve number seven. Also, if we follow this down, so you have your parasympathetic fibers and special sensory fibers traveling down the corda, joining the lingual nerve. The nerve below here is the inferior alveolar nerve. The general sensory fibers are just coming from the anterior two thirds. However, here's your submandibular ganglion, just hanging off of the lingual nerve. That's why I like to call it a danglion, which is a dangling ganglion. Yes, that's a dad joke. Anyway, there's the danglion. This is where the presynaptic parasympathetic fibers from the corda tympani via the facial nerve synapse. I know that's a mouthful, but it's important to remember that because the submandibular gland and the sublingual gland, they both receive their postsynaptic parasympathetic fibers, so these are secretomotor fibers, via the submandibular ganglion. Okay, So if you had a bilateral lesion of the parotid glands, you would still be able to make some saliva because you still have the sublingual and submandibular glands. Now let's rotate this around here and look at the surface of the tongue. Okay, so now let's have a look at the tongue. If we look at the tongue, we can see that it has different structures, right? It has taste buds. It actually has four different types of taste buds. Well, I should probably rather say papillae. And for most purposes, knowing that there are four different types of papillae you might find on the tongue is probably going to suffice. However, just to name some, you have the valate papillae. The valate papillae are in the form of pretty short cylinders that are sunk into the tongue and are surrounded by deep furrows. And the walls of these are studded with taste buds. Those papillae will just lie in a row, as you can see here, just anterior to the region called the sulcus terminalis, which is back here, which is the demarcation between the anterior two thirds and the posterior third of the tongue. A little bit further back, here it says now this is a lingual tonsil. That's just basically a collective term for the lymphoid nodules that are located along the root of the tongue. 
So all the way on the posterior aspect of the tongue, maybe if we rotate around here we can see it, there is an embryological remnant that would be located about here that is named the foramen cecum. This is the remnant of where the thyroglossal duct was connected because the thyroid gland and the tongue used to be connected. In some cases there is something called a thyroglossal duct cyst uh, which you can then see as a little bulge in the neck. They're usually benign, can be removed, often don't have to be removed. But note that there is this little indentation at the back of the tongue called the foramen cecum. Also, there's something quite useful here. If I click on this, you can see there are two muscles, right? There's the palatopharyngeus and the palatoglossus. Well, the palatopharyngeus goes down from the palate to the pharynx and the palatoglossus goes from the palate to the tongue. If we turn this over here and look from the inside, we can actually move and zoom in and we can see that they actually form arches, right? The arch from the palate to the pharynx is called the palatopharyngeal arch and the arch from the palate to the tongue is called the palatoglossal arch. Very well. Right in between the palatopharyngeal and palatoglossal arch, you actually have your palatine tonsil. Okay, These muscles are very small, and the tonsils, if you are working in an anatomy lab and the donors are older, let's say, you will often not find these tonsils. However, where you would find them is between the palatopharyngeal and palatoglossal arches. Let's switch over to the blood supply of the tongue. The arteries of the tongue derive from the lingual artery, which arises from the ECA or external carotid artery. That's your external carotid artery, and here's your lingual artery. As the lingual artery enters the tongue, it passes deep to the hyoglossus muscle, which we can see here from the hyoid to the tongue, and there it then splits, and some of the branches would, for instance, be your sublingual artery, and your deep lingual artery. The veins of the tongue will include your lingual vein, the sublingual vein, there's also, not shown here, the dorsal lingual veins, and deep lingual veins. And they'll usually begin at the apex of the tongue all the way over here, and run posteriorly beside the lingual frenulum along the sublingual vein. In the end, you can see it all goes back to the internal jugular vein back here. Lymphatic drainage from the tongue follows different routes. So lymph from the posterior third will drain to the superior deep cervical nodes on both sides, like these for instance. Lymph from the medial part of the tongue, especially the anterior two thirds, will drain to the inferior deep cervical lymph nodes. Lymph from the lateral aspects of the tongue, so left and right lateral aspects here, will drain to the submandibular lymph nodes. Lymph from the tip of the tongue, or the apex of the tongue, and the frenulum will drain to the submental lymph nodes, and this is the lymph node and the lymph vessels. And lymph from the posterior one third of the tongue back here will drain bilaterally. Let's briefly revisit the salivary glands. Please recall that the parotid gland is innervated via the glossopharyngeal nerve, and the sublingual and submandibular glands are innervated via the facial nerve. Specifically, it's branched the little cord, a tympani that joins the lingual nerve from V3 and synapses in the submandibular ganglion down here. Saliva is a clear, tasteless, odorless, viscid fluid which is secreted by these glands. And those glands, they actually are important because they keep the mucous membrane of the mouth moist, they lubricate the food during mastication, and digestion actually already starts in the mouth. Yeah, because we're chopping up the food basically, or like grinding it down, and we have amylase in our saliva, so the digestion of starches already starts in the oral cavity. In addition to that, our saliva acts as an intrinsic mouthwash, and as such it plays an important role in the prevention of tooth decay and the ability to taste. The three major salivary glands we've covered, those would be the parotid, submandibular, and sublingual. That's also the order in their size from big to small. And there's some accessory salivary glands that are scattered all over the palate, the lips, the cheeks, and the tonsils, and the tongue. If you are fortunate enough to get to dissect out the oral cavity,
you might have the heads in a hemisected fashion that will facilitate the whole process. So for your orientation, we're looking at it from the left side. Here's the dorsum of the tongue. This here would actually be hemisected otherwise. We're looking at it from a superolateral view now. What we see here is the submandibular duct. And so the submandibular duct arises from part of the gland that is between the mylohyoid and hyoglossus muscles. So it passes from lateral to medial. The lingual nerve loops underneath it as it runs anteriorly to open via one of approximately three orifices anteriorly here on a region which is a small fleshy sublingual papilla that will be positioned left and right of the lingual frenulum. Interestingly, if you look in the mirror and elevate your tongue, the orifices of the submandibular ducts are visible. And if the tongue is elevated and retracted, in some individuals that make especially much saliva, saliva can actually spray out of these ducts in quite a dramatic fashion.